So hello everyone once again from the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Now the opposite thing to socialism actually ruins football and that is capitalism. And capitalism has like always ruined football but I guess it's drastically ruined the game since like the birth of like cable television broadcasting these games like Sky Sports for example in the 1990s and how much TV revenue that generated and then we just have more and more billionaires buying up clubs and of course, what Qatar represents is the influence of Gulf Arab money in football itself. Clubs like Manchester City, which were nowhere near the top of the English game, now are one of the best clubs out there, thanks a lot to Gulf money. And because Gulf money has so much influence now, that is how we get something like the Qatar World Cup. And as we're going to get into, it's basically like the fire Festival version of the World Cup given to a country that really does not have much of football culture, had to essentially create all the infrastructure after they won the bid and are still actually creating the infrastructure while the World Cup goes on. Capitalism is ruining football in many, many ways, known as the people's game, the working man slash woman's game. Now it literally has just become a plaything for American and Gulf Arab billionaires who want to just squeeze every little bit of profit out of the game. That's why I get the president of FIFA saying there should be a World Cup every two years and they should massively expand the number of teams in it because we all want loads of boring games to go on top of the genuinely interesting ones. So today what we're going to talk about is just the Qatar World Cup. We're going to talk about the good, we're going to talk about a lot of the bad things. I'm going to talk about how Qatar is a monument to how capitalism is increasingly ruining football, something that I'm deeply passionate about as we're going to get into. I'm not going to waffle too much about my social media plugs. All I'm going to say for this one, because we have a lot to get into today, is that if you want to support my work continuing for the future, please check out my Patreon. I want to build as many $1 to $3 patrons as possible, and the benefits include getting access to exclusive patron-only travel videos, also getting access to the Discord server, and also getting access to to my Nintendo Switch friend code. Also just check out my social media, Twitter, Instagram, all of that good stuff. Though I already know upon making this video, it's literally gonna be one of the worst viewed videos on my channel because most of my audience are Americans and Americans don't really care about football. We do have the USA versus England later today for you guys watching this. The only time I'm ever going to be patriotic about being English is when we play the USA. I'm going from come out your black and tans to literally celebrating the War of 1812 where the British burnt down the White House because I can't accept the Yanks beating England in a game of football. But before we start talking about the World Cup, a lot of you guys might be watching this. You don't even really like football, but you like my content on my channel. So I just want to give you an insight into how much like I really love football. So in terms of me playing football, I've always played football since I was five years old. I would say it's the only sport I was ever like significantly good at. Like I was always an athletic kid and stuff. I played all the sports like rugby, tennis, cricket. I played all of those stuff, but the only one I was actually good at was football. When I was a young kid, I was really, really good. When I played center back for our 11 aside team in like year six and year seven, we went like unbeaten all season in like the top league in our area. We were really, really good, but then the pressure I really hated, my manager was such a tyrant, which made me play better but I just fell out of love of football. So I quit it for a couple of years, started playing for the school team when I was like 13, 14. And then thankfully when I was 17, me and my friends actually started our own club. My friend was the manager owner and I was like co-founder and club captain. And it was just so, so fun, absolutely loved it. And a lot of the people I've been playing with, I'd always played with because most of my friends come from my primary school and secondary school. So that was a nice bonus as well. Probably put some footage on screen of me doing like some skill when I was like 18. And I was really unfit at this age, so I wasn't even that good, but I played a lot at uni. I've traditionally played like center back mainly when I was a kid, but I played more like left wing as an adult and sometimes sent a forward. When I was 23, I decided I'm gonna take football more seriously. And on top of playing the five-a-side league, I still play today, or when I'm in England, I still play. I actually tried out for like this semi-pro team that's local, it's not as good as it sounds. And I got in and I played about a season and it made me insanely fit. And what was good about playing is it really dispelled any notions that I could have ever been a professional footballer because the standard was just like crazy good. And I'm not saying I didn't fit in, but you just had to try really hard. And some people were absolutely ridiculous. And this was just like, you know, standard local semi-pro. So thankfully, you know, all regrets about not taking football more seriously were dispelled in that year. Cause I was like, as good as I feel I am at football sometimes, 
I would never be near the level or the dedication it takes. I'm a professional footballer. So these days I just play like local competitive five-a-side league. Thankfully, after about five years, we actually won the league for the first time. And then we actually won the league a second time back to back. I played all the games in the first season. I played about three quarters before I went to Vietnam, the second one. Credit to the lads where the season actually came down to the last day and they had to win a game by 12 goals to win the league. And the mad lads actually did it. We beat the team above us by plus three goals. And that's how we won the league. And I'm hoping to play Sunday League when I get back to England with a team that some other people I know from school have set up. So that should be fun. I've pretty much just played with the same people since I was about six or seven, which is really nice because we just have that chemistry. Part of the reason I quit playing semi-pro is because I hated the people and I hated the environment. It was just really, really toxic. And I feel like football should be fun. Yeah, I take it seriously, but you need to have like the social angle. And that's why I like it so much. I absolutely love playing. I'm also a big supporter of Manchester United. But I also have a season ticket at Brentford. Brentford are my local team. Been going since I was about five years old. And of course, thankfully, Brentford have become amazing. Play in the Premier League, recently beat Man City away 2-1. And it gives me the dilemma of I now support two teams in the Premier League because Brentford have always been bad. They'd only gotten good in the last about eight years and only got in the Premier League in 2021. So if you guys think I'm just weird for supporting two Prem teams, that's why. Oh yeah, I absolutely love football. I watch so much football, Italian League, French League, Premier League. I don't care. If I have it on an app, I'm going to watch it while playing games or doing work or something. And when it comes to the World Cup or the Euros, I'm watching every game. And I'm really upset because in Vietnam, it's become very hard to watch every game. Despite having two VPNs, I seemingly can't get secure streams for like the whole game. So the amazing games we've had so far, and now let's talk about the positive of the Qatar World Cup. Games like Saudi Arabia, Argentina, I missed all the goals on that, even though I was watching it on a low quality stream. I missed the goals for the Japan-Germany game. And let's just talk about that for a second in regards to Qatar. I don't necessarily believe that a state has to be perfect for them to host the World Cup. Because, you know, we see teams like Saudi Arabia, right? You watch that game, you want them to win because you just love an underdog story. You love a new country, I guess, that people don't really know in terms of football and ability. And they beat one of the best teams in the world. They beat a team on a massive unbeaten streak. And you just see what it means to those people. You see what it means to their fans. Not all Saudis represent their government. And although you have the sports washing element, Hamid bin Salman was actually at the opening ceremony front and center. It's still just you love it because you know the people in Saudi Arabia absolutely love that. You don't care about the government. Saudi Arabia actually has a great footballing culture. Qatar doesn't. And we're going to talk about that a bit more. But then you have stuff like Japan. I fundamentally disagree with the Japanese government, of course. But you love to see that sort of win against Germany. And I don't necessarily disagree with a country hosting the World Cup despite having a terrible government. The United States is going to host the next World Cup. I hate the United States government. I hate the US as an entity. I'm totally happy for it to host the World Cup because it has a really good up and coming footballing culture and it will do so much for American football. And even in terms of Russia, despite it being this horrible, you know, dictatorship, I do see the arguments about sports washing with Putin. But at the same time, Russia has a really rich footballing culture. As a country, it's mad about football, has historically also had really good teams in European competitions as well. One of the best goalies of all time came from the Soviet Union. And it also had the infrastructure to host that tournament because it has such a big footballing culture. And now let's get on to Qatar. Qatar does not have this footballing culture. It does not have a massive population of rabid fans like Russia has or like Ukraine or Poland who've hosted previous tournaments. It's not like England, so I literally cannot see any reason Qatar got to host it apart from corruption. Yes, that's why Russia also got to host it, but at the same time, you can justify it at least because Russia has a good footballing culture and a rich footballing history. Qatar has none of that. It's just the monument to how capitalism is ruining football by giving it to a country that neither has the footballing culture, does not have the infrastructure to host this tournament, and also has a terrible government. So you've got the trifecta there of why Qatar shouldn't have hosted the World Cup. Now I said this is the fire Festival. This is the fire Festival of the World Cup. So let's start with the thing that is most relatable to fire Festival. That is the fan villages or the accommodation for people coming from all around the world to Qatar, this insanely hot country, to cheer on their nation in the World Cup. So there's a really good video on BBC where a guy actually tested it out. But of course, I cannot show you that clip. So I'm going to show you some pictures from the report. We're going to talk about it and then just read some quotes of people staying there. 
because it's an absolute joke. This country has had over 10 years to prepare itself for the World Cup and it still couldn't get it right because it's a monumental task. And of course, as we're going to get onto later, it was built on the back of slave migrant labor as well. This country was not prepared for a World Cup. So I actually stopped over in Qatar on my flight to Hanoi. And even at like midnight, we went outside for a tiny bit. It was absolutely roasting. That was only two months ago. I know it's a bit colder there now. But here you see the rooms they get and the tents. Like, this is the biggest fire festival vibe. So if you guys don't remember, fire festival tents that like disaster relief tents or something. And people paid so much money. So people were actually paying £170 a night for these. And there's no air conditioning. The material makes it even hotter. And all you get is an electronic fan. And there you see some people in there. And then the toilet facilities are just like out in the baking sun. You have toilets and showers and sinks and stuff like that. Um, the water is brown, according to people living there. And also you get the nice view of construction going on all around you while the World Cup has also started. And then they also have a big screen in the middle of like some dirty, like hot, empty area where you can watch other games. But who's going to want to do that? So it's an absolute joke. And the host actually stayed the night there. But just going to read the article, which shares some quotes from the actual video. So, um... It's still under construction. In the daytime, it's kind of like hell in there. It's a desert. It's too hot. Surprisingly, as Shogo Nakashima delivers the scathing review of his home for the next two weeks, he has a smile on his face. One that says, if I don't laugh, I might cry. I cannot change where to stay right now, so I have to accept it and wait for Japan's match. I'm very happy this guy got to see them beat Germany, at least. I'll only be here for sleeping. I'll go out and explore the city. I don't want to stay here. The 31-year-old from Japan is one of the first people to arrive in the Haifun Island fan village just north of Doha, where construction is still being carried out in some areas a few hours after it was open. There are 1,800 tents, each capable of housing two people. Pedro and Fatima live in Spain, but are here to cheer on Mexico. They got married in April, and this trip is part of their honeymoon. It costs about £175 a night. To be honest, it wasn't what I expected. When you see the pictures and read the description, and it's a FIFA World Cup, you expect a little bit of quality. This is like a subpar hostel that you find backpacking across the world. It's like it being in a greenhouse, so we weren't able to sleep past 9 a.m. even though we were exhausted because of the flight. There's no organization whatsoever. No one knows anything. The stores are closed. There's no drinking water. This is really definitely not what we paid for. For some, the reality of the situation calls for more drastic action. Jamal, who has traveled from Paris, paid about £2,700 for a three-week stay at the fan village. Amazing. But after less than 24 hours at the site, he is packing his bags and heading the exit. For me, it's not a good experience. There's no shower gel, no toothbrush, no toothpaste. He also shared with us his booking confirmation sheet and the fact he thought he was turning up to a hotel. So immediately, when I read this report and watched the video, I thought of Fire Festival. These people who'd been conned out of so much money from an insanely wealthy government and nation, no less, to stay at these terribly constructed tents in basically the middle of the desert during the day. And I don't know about you, people have gone camping and it's hot out. Like I went camping about two years ago in like July and about 9 a.m. my tent was cooking. This is in England. Imagine being in Doha in the Middle East and trying to stay in those tents and all you have is a fan absolutely insane that they're charging so much for this maybe if they charge like 10 pound a night 20 pound a night i'd be like yeah okay i guess it's like quickly constructed but hey it's cheap like a backpacker's hostel like this guy was saying but no 175 pound a night you could get some insanely nice hotels in Saigon where I'm staying for that. Instead, they got some horrible tent in the middle of the desert with nothing around it. I'm sad that guy got conned out of that money and they even said he was staying at a hotel for that price and he just ended up in the middle of the desert in a tent. So just as Fire Festival was this big con, so is the Qatar World Cup for fans. Now, speaking of fans, I mentioned Qatar does not have a good footballing culture. If you hosted the World Cup in places like England or Western Europe, Pretty much every single game is going to be full, both with traveling fans and locals who love football, right? It's pretty hard to actually get tickets to a lot of these games when they're hosted in countries of football and culture. Well, in Qatar, don't worry, 
most of the stadiums are actually empty when they play and they've actually paid loads of migrant workers to pretend to be fans of various nations. I've read that fans of like Germany and Denmark have really not come in big numbers, Holland as well. I have seen a fair few like England fans and of course what Qatar is good for is you've got a load of Iranian fans, Tunisian fans, loads of Middle Eastern and North African countries fans have showed up in force. So I guess that's nice of them. Obviously an absolute ton of Saudis who've just driven over the border. And I'm not inherently opposed to a Middle Eastern World Cup or a MENA region World Cup. It's just that they chose Qatar, not Egypt, not even Saudi Arabia. Like I said, for all the terrible things that country is doing right now, the redeeming thing in terms of the FIFA World Cup is it has actually a pretty good footballing culture. No, they chose Qatar where every single club game has empty stadiums. They play like really decent players, loads of money to go play there who only come for the money. But talking more on the fan stuff, Qatar accused of paying hundreds of fake supporters to parade for the cameras ahead of the World Cup. Um, footage has emerged of football supporters from across the globe filling the streets of Doha a week before the World Cup kicks off. Qatar Living, dubbed the country's first official community platform on TikTok, has been posting videos of fans from different countries gathered in their hundreds with flags, painted faces and banners. It's not clear whether the fans are migrant workers who live in Qatar and have been partying early or whether the parades have been staged by the authorities. Another post appears to show England fans chanting and playing the drums, marching through the streets holding a banner which says it's coming home, but it obviously wasn't England fans. The behaviour of the supporters appears to be carefully curated and staged, and questions have been raised about the legitimacy of the fans. Some have accused Qatar of orchestrating the parade using fake supporters and questioning why fans have arrived in their masses before more than a week before the World Cup starts. So like I said, Qatar is not only paying fans, it also has empty seats, very visibly on TV in these absolutely massive stadiums. So another article, image of empty seats exposes Qatar World Cup crowd lie. On the opening two match days of the tournament, eyebrows were raised and conspiracy theories launched as official attendances came in well higher than the capacity of the stadiums the matches were played in. And this was despite thousands of empty seats as seen in images taken during the middle of matches. Qatar's latest whopper came after suggesting the 68,000 capacity Al Bat Stadium was near full for last night's Morocco-Croatia game. Despite the image in the tweet below showing more empty seats than filled seats, the organization claimed 59,000 fans were in attendance. And you see the tweets here, Morocco fans making decent sound in the Al Khor, even though stadium is about half empty. Perhaps organizers had tension between having enough accommodation and letting ticketless fans enter country to buy an arrival. Small local population means the games aren't full. So like I've been saying, I don't necessarily believe every country that hosts the FIFA World Cup has to be perfect because I believe as a celebration of football that your average person should be able to experience the World Cup pretty much no matter what country they come from. But at the same time, if you don't have a population of people who want that, then why are you hosting it? It's pretty much you're only given it because you want to use it for sports washing and prestige and FIFA have given you it because of corruption. If you cannot fill your own stadiums for the games and most of the fans inside are like traveling contingents from other countries, it's pretty clear your population just doesn't care about football and you don't have that footballing culture and you don't have that footballing infrastructure. So there is no argument to overlook the terrible human rights abuses Qatar did preparing for the World Cup beyond it just being like a terrible country anyway. Like I support football as like the people's game, but Qatar does not have the people who are fans of football to justify hosting the World Cup there. And that goes in hand in hand with the political issues, right? And I do find it curious, just before we get into this, that there weren't as much protest at the Russia World Cup. And in my mind, I agree a bit with the hypocrisy of a lot of these Western countries going to Qatar and being like, we are standing up for human rights. We are standing up for gay rights. Where was that at the Russian World Cup? You guys didn't do anything then. I'm not suggesting anything, but I find it quite curious that when it's an Arab Muslim country, you guys all feel comfortable doing it. When it's a white European country, don't hear much about it. But that's not saying they shouldn't protest. I fully agree that they should protest and they should use sport as a platform to elevate political protest for the marginalized groups. The problem being is that the moment they faced a tiny hurdle, the European teams all backed down. So basically, if you've missed it, the European teams were meant to wear a one love armband supportive of the LGBT community. Qatar is one of the worst places in the world to be in that community. 
And it would be a nice show of solidarity in the world stage, in spite of FIFA being insanely corrupt and giving Qatar this World Cup based on you know bribes and not taking into consideration either their human rights abuses or taking into consideration how they don't have a footballing culture. But then the news came that FIFA might take action against the captains of the football teams who wear the armband, right? So it was rumored that it could be a fine, but it could go as far as getting a yellow card every time you wear one. So if you guys don't know the rules of football, you get a yellow card as like a first offense if you do a bad tackle, handball, loads of different things. And then you get a red card if you get another yellow. You can also just get a straight red card. If you do get two yellows that equal a red card, you get banned for the next game. So Harry Kane is England's best player, top goal scorer. So if he got a yellow card in the game, he'd be out for the next one. So England decided they wouldn't do it. And all the European teams decided they wouldn't do it. They didn't want their football to suffer because the protest actually didn't really mean anything. And I don't like using the word virtue signaling, but it is pretty much virtue signaling if you plan to do a protest for gay rights in a country that's terrible for gay rights and then back down because the captain of your team might get a yellow card. That's all. Is that all it took? One yellow card. And even if you got a red card, right? That is good because your protest is doing something and it will bring attention to it. But instead they back down and wore this like FIFA anti-discrimination one, really wishy-washy. And it's just a bit of a joke because all these people are coming out and saying like, Qatar's terrible for human rights abuses. Qatar treats gay people terribly. And then they all go and cover the World Cup. Even Alex Scott, who's a very, very popular sports commentator in the UK, she wore the armband herself when she was covering the game. But then people asked her before, like, well, why are you even going to Qatar in the first place? And she's like, well, I love my job. It was a hard decision. Why couldn't the BBC and other groups make a studio at home? It's not like people don't do this all the time where they cover foreign football games from domestic studios. These people are just hypocrites. They want the fame. They want the cushy jobs. They don't actually care about gay rights. And another funny thing as well, these people barely ever say anything about discrimination towards the LGBT community in Britain itself which is getting worse. This isn't a joke. Britain is one of the main Western European countries that is going backwards on LGBT rights, including our new prime minister, who's firmly a transphobe, including the Labour Party, who will never stick up for trans rights and has loads of transphobes among them. So also it'd be nice, as part of your allyship, all these hypocritical pundits and football players, why don't you call out the UK government as well? And also, why, Alec, call out the UK government's human rights abuses as well. And the president of FIFA, which I'm going to talk about in a sec, he kind of uses this as cover, saying... Well, the West does all these human rights abuses, so they're hypocrites in terms of like criticizing Qatar, which I don't agree with necessarily, but I do agree with these guys are hypocrites in that they will never protest their own government doing despicable things. The United States, the UK, and their little allies in NATO, like Denmark, for example, that's happy to go along with every single war that these guys do to prop up the status quo. And of course, how much Qatari money is actually in Britain itself? I read recently that the Qatari elite have like a multi-billion dollar property portfolio in Britain. There recently has been a new deal announced in the summer by the UK government to work closely with Qatar on business dealings. And like with many Gulf states, most Gulf states are propped up by the West in the first place. So we are complicit in their human rights abuses, right? So I just find the whole thing hypocritical and the Western grandstanding. And then it shows how hollow it is because the minute FIFA say, well, Harry Kane or any other captain of a European country that tries this, you'll get a yellow card right away at the start of the game. And they're like, okay, I won't wear it then. I won't wear it. I can't have a yellow card. I can't potentially have my footballing career harm. I'll just appease FIFA and I'll forget the suffering of the LGBT community in Qatar. It's a real like liberal virtue signaling, which shows they fundamentally don't care about the real issues involved in LGBT discrimination at large, but also particularly in Qatar. But of course, what makes this even more of a joke is that Ecuadorian and Mexico fans were chanting homophobic things at their matches and now FIFA are looking at sanctioning the fans, right? So FIFA, make your mind up. You're either for gay rights and LGBT rights, or you're not. You can't tell England that Harry Kane is gonna get a yellow card for wearing a rainbow armband and then try and sanction Ecuadorian fans for homophobic chants. You can't just have your cake and eat it too. So while on the subject of FIFA, let's get into how Qatar is a monument to how capitalism is ruining football. Like I said, Qatar shouldn't have been awarded the World Cup whatsoever. There is no justification. As bad as Russia is, at least I can understand some arguments, even though that was done through corruption as well. Now, the former president of FIFA, Sepp Blatter, gave a comment recently, and he said, the 2022 World Cup was supposed to go to the US, which is hosting it next. 
A week before the FIFA convention, Michel Platini called me that he'd just spoken with the French president, Sarkozy, who told him to vote for Qatar. Six months later, Qatar bought fighter jets from France for $14.6 billion. And Sepp Blatter said this, the guy who rewarded it to them, the country is too small, football in the World Cup are too big for it, the decision was a mistake. The executive committee decided that the 2018 World Cup would go to Russia and the 2022 World Cup to the US. It would be a sign of peace, having two countries with a long history of political clashes hosting the World Cup back to back. That's an absolute joke, but no doubt it's true coming from an insider on that deal. Now, Vox has a good explainer of some more elements of the corruption that got Qatar the World Cup. So FIFA awarded Qatar the World Cup in 2010, um, but before this decision was announced, there was of course loads of corruption scandals in FIFA. So in 2014, Sunday Times reported on a trove of leaked emails and other documents suggesting that prominent Qatari soccer official and a former FIFA executive committee member, Mohammed bin Haman, had allegedly paid millions of dollars worth of bribes to FIFA officials. A subsequent investigation into corruption allegations conducted by FIFA FIFA's chief ethics investigator and former US attorney Michael J. Garcia found evidence of serious irregularities in the bidding process but offered no conclusive proof that Qatari officials had used bribes to influence the outcome of the vote. In May 2015, the US Department of Justice unsealed indictments against FIFA officials, accusing the officials of racketeering, wire fraud, and money laundering in connection with a far-reaching scheme to sell broadcasting rights for the tournament. Soon after, authorities in Switzerland announced a parallel investigation into allegations of corruption into the bidding processes for the 2018 World Cup in Russia and Qatar. And then in April, the US Justice Department released fresh evidence suggesting that three FIFA officials accepted bribes from unnamed intermediaries to vote for Qatar. So obviously the only reason Qatar even got it was money. That's well established now. And just to make this even worse, because Qatar only won it because of money and no other reasons, like I said, they had no infrastructure to actually construct the tournament. So Vox also reporting about the labor conditions, mainly migrant labor. So the horror of Qatar's worker system are no secret and the dangerous conditions created by that system are not unique to preparations for the World Cup. Up until the late 2010s, the vast majority of Qatar's roughly 2 million migrant laborers, who compose about 94% of the country's labor force, were employed through a notoriously coercive system known as the kafala or sponsorship, which tethered workers to a sponsor for a series of legally binding contracts. As Qatar ramped up its preparations for the World Cup, the consequences of this system have been increasingly deadly. In 2021, The Guardian reported that more than 6,500 workers from India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka had died in Qatar since 2010. Meanwhile, workers interviewed by Amnesty International have reported enduring an array of abuses including wage theft, excessive working hours, dangerous working and living conditions, and physical abuse. I just found these interesting comments on Reddit under um, a story posted by the Times. World Cup workers sent home from Qatar, unable to repay money lending debts that took them to go to Qatar with hopes to earn money to support their family. So one comment, I'm from India and my experience is anecdotal, but people literally pawn all the jewelry they own. And in one case, a woman pawned her tiley, which is basically the necklace you tie at the time of marriage, the equivalent to a Westerner selling their wedding rings to get to Qatar. This is their make or break, the only way to feed their kids to give them a good education so they don't have to endure the same strife, or at least that's the dream they're sold on. They aren't just robbing these men, but every life dependent on them, not to mention the money lenders in India operate under zero legal purview and hence can directly intimidate these men's families if they fall back on their payment. It's an unconscionable crime against basic human decency and a travesty that a sport I love, which has brought billions of people joy and brief respite from the misery around the world, contributes directly to the death of so many of my countrymen. So one more comment, there's this Dutch journalist who made a documentary about World Cup migrant workers in Qatar. He went to Nepal to talk to people involved in this. This one family lived in a small village, people working in agriculture, manual labor, earning very low wages. They had borrowed money from the village to send their son to Qatar. He died. They still have 1,200 euros to pay off, having no clue how they will manage. They lost a loved one, and on top of that, will be trying to pay off a massive debt while already living in poverty. He also talked to a former intermediary who sent workers to Qatar. 
This guy said they would lie about the wages, saying it's 160 euros instead of the 110 to 120 euros a week. For many, the money was too good to turn down. So they were lied to, worked in terrible conditions, and earned too little money to make a dent in the debt they took on. Some have lasting health conditions, some never made it back all around terrible. So despite like the ridiculousness, the fire festival aesthetic of the Qatar World Cup, underlying it is very serious problems with corruption in FIFA and of course modern day capitalism, but even taken to a more extreme, like these people aren't just having their labor value stolen like so many people do across the capitalist world. They're literally being put into like literal slavery in some cases across the last 12 years and in many cases being lied to so the intermediaries can make a profit sending these migrant workers to Qatar in the first place. It's just an all round gross system which Qatar already had but because of its promise of the World Cup so many were sold on the dream that you can go and make a lot of money work in Qatar. They need people like you because they need to construct the World Cup well, what happened is that these workers were exploited even worse than your average construction worker in these countries are because they knew they could take advantage of them coming over for another country and using Qatar's brutal labor system to really treat these people like subhuman. So absolutely disgusting that not only would FIFA award Qatar the World Cup based on anything, but, but then they overlooked this, right? Because I would have far less problem if Qatar reformed its labor system and imported migrant labor to build the World Cup and pay these people very well, treated them very well. These people made a good living for their families back home. But as soon as FIFA found out about this stuff, it's been well known for about a decade now how badly these World Cup workers have been treated, they should have canceled it. It should have never been allowed to host the World Cup after they found out about this, even after the corruption that allowed them to have it in the first place. And that is essentially what the World Cup is, a monument to how capitalism is ruining football. A country with barely any footballing culture, a country with no footballing infrastructure that has to actually build all of it based on slave migrant labor in some cases, where thousands of them die constructing this World Cup, only for a load of it, not to have even been finished and then to see empty seats in stadium and seeing migrant workers paid to be fake fans of different countries it just shows you the state of the game in 2022 a country like qatar can just use its vast wealth to bribe its way into hosting a game that means so much to so many people around the world like i cycled through a rural northern vietnamese village i saw kids playing football with like a water buffalo in the background and i was just thinking that is how amazing this game is like these kids are playing football and loving football. They're wearing their like fake Manchester City and Manchester United shirts. And a lot of them probably can't even watch these games regularly on TV, but they love this game. And you have that all the way up to the highest level of the competition. Everyone loves football. The World Cup final often has like a billion people watching it. And it's a game for all of us. You can play it with anyone. And all the teams in England basically come out of working class communities. I know the semi-pro team I played for came from like a local scientist community. Arsenal came from people who worked in this armaments factory. All the clubs across England pretty much came from working class communities. And now the big ones are owned by billionaire owners from America or Gulf countries like Qatar. And they're just trying to squeeze every cent out of these brands. And in the case of American owners, they literally want to make it like American sports franchises, which are completely divorced from their own fan bases, where they'll often move teams like across the whole country to make it more lucrative. And that is the attack on football that we're seeing from the capitalist class. They don't care for a lot of people that football is everything, that the football community around their local teams is so much their lives. You watch those documentaries on Netflix like Sunderland Till I Die, and you see how much it means to these people, especially from communities that are very, very poor, like Sunderland or places like Newcastle. And these people just want to take it away because they want to expose our love for the game and they want to monetize it back to us. And they want to milk every single cent out of the game because they know it's so popular. They know we'll pay. Well, they know even people like me will watch the Qatar World Cup because we love the players. We love watching these national teams clash. We love watching games like Saudi Arabia, Argentina. But it just is such a horrible thing how much this World Cup was constructed on terrible working conditions and just corruption. I can make multiple videos about how terrible capitalism and football is together. I'm just depressed. We can't have English football go the way of American sports. Like that would be one of the worst things ever. I'm happy the Glazers 
are going to sell Man United, it seems, these American billionaires who own like American sports teams. But at the same time, you see Newcastle United bought by the Saudis and pumped full of money. What well, is that the future now? We're going to swap our American owners for Gulf Arab owners instead, who are just going to buy up world football where no other country will be able to compete with the likes of Man City and Newcastle and PSG. Let me know down in the comments. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.